Welcome back to the Beyond Rockets podcast. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me today. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what your role here is at Fractal? I'm uh, Larry Lowe, and I'm the owner. I'm Damon Eubanks. I'm the general manager. I'm Robo, and I'm the brewmaster. So the, the, the question I always start the whole conversation with, as, as Huntsville continues to grow and continues to get bigger, uh, more and more people are not originally from Huntsville. Uh, work, and fa work or family brings them here. Are you all originally from Huntsville, or are you one of those that work or family brought you here? Uh, born and raised here in Huntsville. So my mom and dad were from, or they are from Moscow, Idaho, and uh, my dad got his PhD. Mom got her master's at uh, Montana State, and in 1974, the only people hiring um, electrical engineers was Huntsville, Alabama, and they <laughs> thought they were moving to the other side of the moon, and I was born soon after that, and we've been here. Uh, I've got a brother and a sister. We all live in town. Huntsville's home. What about you, Robo? Yep, born and raised. Damon? Also born and raised. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that, that doesn't normally the, happen. Uh, the amount of podcasts yeah. I've done, there's always somebody. Uh, normally, I, it's from somewhere else, work, family, school brought them here. So it's interesting to see that y'all all have been here for a very long time and have yep. seen Huntsville grow along with you. Born in the uh, old, old medical center hospital that predates the Women's and Children's Center over there and um, graduate of Butler High School. Go Rebels. Rest <laughs> in peace. <laughs> so I know that uh, Damon and Robo, y'all's background, you've been in the craft beer industry, uh, craft beer scene for a very long time. Um, Damon, you owned Wish You Were Beer for, uh, when, when, in, in 2019, until 2019, and then Robo, you first had a head, head brewery job in North Carolina, then came back to Huntsville working at Rocket Republic and then Below the Radar before here at Fractal. Um, Larry, your background's not in craft beer at all. Um, you spent over 20 years as a tech leader in radar and satellite communications, and prior to Fractal, you were the vice president of engineering at Gator Technologies. Um, how does, I see how they got into the brewery and like, ended up here, but how did, what's the story of you and craft beer and how going from being an engineer and having a PhD to now being the owner of Fractal Brewing Project, how does, how does that happen? I'd say it's a, maybe a long chain of bad decisions. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. So it's, um, uh, yeah, so uh, career electrical engineering. So started my career at Phase 4 Systems um, under Dr. Fahey. Um, after that, started working at Gator Technologies, had a good career, uh, developed a, a novel uh, antenna that we um, had developed, had a lot of adoption through a lot of military DOD units. Uh, we got acquired in uh, 2016 by Cubic Corporation out of San Diego. I held on for another three years to help with the transition, and I was a little bit burned out. So I was looking for something different to do. Uh, this building, uh, which had been a few beer breweries before this, was dormant. Um, I liked the location. I knew what the city was doing with John Hunt Park, and so I said, hey, let's get into it. On the side, I had also picked up uh, home brewing. Like uh, you know, most people that own breweries, they do start out home brewing. So my good friend Bennett and I, we spent many, um, many uh, afternoon and evening in his uh, driveway and garage brewing um, a lot of mediocre, decent beer. Uh, so it was a good training. <laughs> so, Robo, b before this, like I mentioned, you were at Below the Radar, and I think the connection to Larry was you were doing homebrew stuff with Larry's brother, and Larry, uh, your brother connected you with Robo. I guess you've probably been to Below the Radar during that. When you, what was your first impressions of Larry when you met him? And did, Larry, did you have any sort of inclination about doing the brewery? And what kind of, what process, like at that moment, what did you have as far as Fractal is considered today, ready at that time? There's like three questions in one. Robo, go. Yeah, yeah. go. <laughs> All right. So it's actually funny. So I, I actually worked for Damon back in the day at Wish You Were Beer. I was his homebrew shop manager. And I started doing some classes and stuff out there. And, um, I was doing a hops class one time with Josh Funderburk of Harvest Hops, and um, Larry had actually worked with Josh Funderburk at the time, and next thing I know, there's Larry and Bennett coming in there, and uh, just thought they were <laughs> regular customers that come in there all the time, right? Fast forward a couple of years later, I meet Kevin, me and Kevin homebrewed, drink a lot of beer and stuff, and just one day, he's like, hey, my brother, brother's been talking about wanting to open up a brewery, and I'm like, well, that's funny, me too, I want to do that, so... Uh, he introduced me and Larry, um, kind of like a blind date situation. <laughs> love uh, at first sight, I'm guessing. Love at first sight, right? <laughs> and uh, I remember seeing him, I'm like, wow, I've seen this guy before. He's come to some of my classes. So it was, it was kind of like meant to be. Yeah. Larry, uh, so you, you meet Robo, and at this point, this is probably 2016? 
or so? Uh, maybe a little bit later. It's like 2017, and we meet. Okay. And, um, you know, I, 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 again, knowing that this location was dormant, I was like, well, if you're going to open a brewery, you might need somebody that actually knows how to brew on a professional yeah. level. Yeah. Ho- home, I wasn't going to do it. Home, and so, bre- home brewing did not qualify to open up Fractal. You needed a little bit more experience. Five-gallon, um, you know, homebrew uh, turns to, you know, 15-barrel <laughs> turns is a little bit different calculus. Yes. And so it was, uh, it was nice to have a professional. And so, yeah, it, it, uh, great background. I'd had a lot of his beers before. Before. And so, it, you know, it made sense to at least explore the idea, and here we are today. Yeah, so the spot was open, and I know originally when you were kind of coming up with this plan for the brewery, the original name was Southern Ale Works. How did that process of changing the name to now at Fractal, and like, what did that look like? So, yeah, this, 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 yeah, this story's been told a, a few times, but, but <laughs> yeah, we started as Southern Ale Works. Um, we needed a name. It, it fit, and so we kind of started going with it. Um, I participated in... Um, a craft beer and brewing, they had a brewery accelerator workshop in Denver. And so I went to that, and uh, part of the, it was a four-day um, experience where they exposed you to architecture, prof- you know, all, everything you need to know about opening up a brewery. Um, part of it was a pitch contest to, to pitch your business plan, and so I participated in that, came in second. Um, but when I got done, the attorney raised her hand. She goes, you got a, it sounds like you got a good plan, good location, uh, you're kind of well put together, but you got to realize you got... Uh, trademark issues with your name right off the bat. And I said, I don't. So she said, all right, meet me for coffee. So I met her for coffee the next day, the next morning, and she explained it to me that she goes, look, chop, chop off uh, Ale Works or Brewing Company, those are words common to the industry, and you're left with your mark, um, and you can't trademark Southern. Southern's a general geographic area, and then she goes, and plus it's a submark of Southern Tier, Southern Grist, Southern Prohibition. She rattled off like 12 <laughs> breweries, and she goes, you're going to get a cease and desist the day you open your door. Uh, namely because I represent half of them. And I said, oh, <laughs> that's well, nice to know. No um, taken? So you know, it was one of those very fortunate gut punches because then it forced me to come back and say, okay, who am I? You know, what's my background? What do I want to express with this? And um, as a math team member at Grissom High School, I remember learning about fractals. And um, to me, fractals, are, you know, it's, it's an ever-repeating object. No matter how much you zoom, zoom in or zoom out, it maintains its, its structure. Um, and I just think it's a beautiful combination of art, science, and math, which really represents me and represents Huntsville. And yeah. so I checked the trade space. It was open. I locked it down. I didn't tell anybody. Everybody was getting annoyed and all around town saying, what's the name? What's the name? <laughs> and I said, you'll learn as soon as I get the trademark in hand. And yes. so we did, and, and Fractal Brewing Project was born. So. so you mentioned a little bit earlier about just this location and a, like the history that it has within the craft beer scene. I know, Damon, you actually worked here at one of the other breweries before before it was Fractal. Can you tell me a little bit about what the space looked like for you, Larry, when you got it versus what it looked like for you, Damon, when you actually worked here? Yeah, so I'll say, I mean, this, this building's very interesting. I mean, if there was ever a uh, historic marker for craft beer in Huntsville, it would be on this building. Um, started out as Old Town Brewing. Uh, Old Town had a, had a good run, you know, uh, four or five years. Um, w- once they um, kind of ended their run, Straight to Ale jumped on it, and that's where they just ascended into the company that they are today. I mean, this building, I think everybody tasted Straight to Ale b- beer in this building. Um, and then they moved to Campus 805, and the building here was dormant for two years. Um, at that point in time, it was just a production warehouse. You know, there was a little bit. Damon will tell you what it was like. But, you know, the patio that we have was, it was just an old loading dock that was full of water and bullfrogs and, and nasty <laughs> things for the longest time. And, um so we, we had to do a lot of uh, changes to it to make it functional, to make it fun like it is today. Yeah, so Damon, the, you mentioned a little, like, like I said, a little bit about the space. What was your role here when you worked here? And kind of talk us through, as, as we are live here, for those that are listening later, um, what did the space look like? Uh, well, I worked, here, I worked here for Straight Tail back in 2012, 2013 time frame. I, I worked in the tap room. I, I was a bartender in the tap room. And the tap room used to be in the, in the, which is kind of like, I don't know what you call the, our foyer yeah, room the there. Yeah, the foyer. Yep. So it's, it, it, that was like a, a garage room. I think Old Town originally stored like that little car they used to run around in, uh, around town in. They parked that thing in there. I can't remember what kind of car it was. But uh, when Straight Dale came in and tap rooms were, were made legal, then they put the, uh, that's where they uh, threw together a, a, a quick and, uh, you know, uh, do it yourself, a DIY uh, tap room. It was like it was like hanging out in your buddy's garage, and it, it really was. A, it became a really popular spot, and um, and it was a lot of good times here. So, but, uh, but yeah, it's so. There's definitely a lot of history here, and it's kind of fun for me to be back in here again, helping grow another brewery in here. 
uh, in the space. And, and so since, since we've come in and, uh, and, and Larry and Robo came in and have really just transformed this building into a really uh, interesting space that um, uh, kind of opens it up a lot more than the way, way it used to be. I, I guess with straight tail, they used to allow you to sit out in the actual brewery, which was kind of an interesting thing, but it could be a little uh, strange at times too. <laughs> so this is, this is really nice. So you, we still have the advantage of being able to, you know, see all the equipment and see what's going on in here. It would, but we have, you know, floor spaces dedicated to, uh, for customers. So, yeah. So plus Larry, the uh, rental room. Yeah. So Larry, the, the building was vacant for two years prior for you, for when you got it, what year did you get this building and how long did that build out process take for you to then to actually open the doors to actually have fractal be here? So we, we spent a good bit of 2018, um, just looking at the building, um, Dr. Miller owned it, and so we'd come through, and we kept, you know, kind of looking at it, imagining what the space could be. So that was all 2018, and then we finally closed. I closed on the building. Um, I think it was like January 3rd, 2019. Already had architecture plan. Julie Hay, uh, fantastic architect here in town. She um, created some incredible plans for us. Uh, I think we broke ground April 2019, and the building was. Uh, certificate of occupancy in September, and we opened September 15th, 2019. So 2019 was really the year that the building and the property transformed. Yeah, so Robo, um, obviously a lot of the head brewer jobs that you had before this, the brewery was already established before you got there. You were, beca you were taking over as a head brewer for a lot of the places, but here you got able to actually kind of build out the brewery, kind of what geared and kind of fits you the best. How, how did that process work and kind of, I mean, obviously you had the experience, but how long did that process take for you to kind of build out what we see now as the brewery? So the first brewery I actually worked at that was actually paid was a brand new brewery and uh, we were we were built out in the summer, so I got to kind of see how a build-out process was. Yeah. So it, it gave me a little bit of experience and background in the beginning to be able to say, okay, cool, this is how connections are made. This is what I need to plan for and stuff like that. And then working at all the other breweries and a brew pub, different sizes, um, I was able to bring everything I've learned, everything I wanted to see different, everything I wish would have been different, a lot easier to manage. I uh, brought it here and... Um, as soon as we got the building, I remember being in here for three weeks on my hands and knees with a little hammer drill busting up the old tile on this brew <laughs> floor just so I can get it up, get it cleaned up. So I went out there with chalk, and I actually spent probably two weeks out there with chalk just drawing things out, uh, contacting manufacturers, getting sizing and specs for all the equipment so I could come out here and kind of measure it out and draw it out so we could look at it and say, cool, this is exactly where this is going to be, where this, where this is going to be, uh, planning the overhead glycol, stuff like that. So just trying to to plan everything out. So when you look at our brew floor, it, it's all a sequence. And that's how I want it. I want you to be able to say, cool, it starts here, goes there, and goes all the way down in a pattern. Um, instead of kind of a, a mixed floor plan like you see in some breweries. I want people to walk up since we were open floor plan and get an easy tour that they can give themselves. Yeah. So I got all the equipment labeled and everything. And then when people ask for a tour, it's fun because I go over there and it's <laughs> like, okay. If you can read with me, mash done. This is what this does. Boil cup, this is what this does. And then ferments. And we're done. It's, yeah. it's real easy. It's real simple. And it allows people to come in, be a part of the, the production, the brew floor, and then kind of give themselves a self-tour. Yeah, I mean, like that, I think that's the most, one of the most exciting things about the space now is that you are able to see the brewery as you're able to consume the beers that you're, you're producing during a podcast, during a, a, a band performance. Where, and the backdrop lends itself well. And I think a lot of it, too, I mean, at the time, I mean, you're able to build out this process and build out the beer... The, the brewery from really from ground zero. And so you were able to kind of envision too what you wanted the future for Fractal to look like and kind of give you the space to allow you to do that when the time came. Oh, absolutely. And, Everything was designed for expansion. Yes. Just so we could keep that flow going. And so you, you opened the doors. Was the success overwhelming for Fractal? Did Fractal become the next biggest place on Lehman Ferry in, in Huntsville? Or was it a little slow? I mean, I guess the, the, the craft beer scene was huge, but what did that success look like when you opened the doors? We became the next biggest thing on Lehman Ferry Road, which I mean, the bar for that is about as low as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's see. Um, you know, opening September 2019, times were good. 2019 was a great year, you know, and we opened September, and uh, the first three months, it was, um, it was blowing and going, and it felt really good. Uh, but then we went 
straight into March 2020, which was COVID. So, I mean, the, the opening was great. We had a great response. Community came out. There was enough um, uh, knowledge of this building. And, uh, people had seen it under construction. They, you know, everybody want, that had been here when it was straight to ale wanted to come back and see what it is as Fractal. So we had a great, great opening. Yeah. And like you said, your business plan you'd put together for Fractal, you get ready to open and everything's great. How... How do, what did the business plan then change to when you had to pivot when COVID happened? And how were you able to kind of stay afloat when so many places and so many small businesses, especially so early on in, in Fractal's existence, failed? And how were you able to succeed and kind of still be here today? Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was difficult, especially for somebody who had no idea what they were doing in food and beverage to begin with. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it got real challenging real quick because as everything shut down, we were still uh, designated, um, what's the, we could come to work, what, what did that mean? Uh, we, were, oh, we were essential workers. We were essential workers, thank you, Chris. Yeah, we were designated essential workers so we could come to work, but the thing is, is that all the retail accounts had closed down as well. Yeah. So nobody was buying beer, and so we couldn't produce beer, and I couldn't sell in the tap room, so I had to let the staff go. You know, I was like, this is going to be temporary. As soon as it turns back on, I'm going to hire everybody back. Um, so it was just me for about six weeks, and wow. we've got a little canning machine, and uh, we were able to sell beer to go on the patio as long as they weren't consuming it on property. And so for, th <laughs> for about six to eight weeks, I was sitting there looking out that window at beautiful John Hunt Park with very few people coming and visiting me. <laughs> um, but I filled cans, and we, we kind go. of uh, we got through, and then we're, things started opening back up. You know, hired the staff back, and um, I don't know. It's been it's been difficult now. I mean, now things are things are better. Things are headed in a, in a much better trajectory. But I still don't have year on year metrics to know what's normal. Yeah. I, you know, I still haven't had a, a year to compare to yet, just because everything's been down in the COVID years that were so manic, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So. It's been tough. Yeah, and like, and like, especially with the background that you have in, in, in engineering and math, I mean, the numbers is really what you love. And so that, those, having, not having those numbers kind of allows you to kind of, you're taking a step into an unknown territory, and the lights are off, and you have no idea what you're doing, and COVID definitely does not help. Um, one thing that I read, Larry, that was, that was super interesting um, was there was an article that was written about you while you were at Gator or, or as you were starting the brewery. I can't remember which one. Um, and at, at your time at Gator, you kind of watched the President Paul kind of run the show. You were kind of the, um, you were riding shotgun, but he was making a lot of the decisions. And a big thing when, when you kind of exited your career there and decided to kind of move on was that you wanted to run the show. How much of that, of the knowledge of like running a show, even at, the, at that tech and radar level, prepared you for what you do now and how much of it didn't prepare you? And how much of it is still unknown? I mean, like he said, food and beverage is very new to you. No, uh, good, good question. So I, I was very fortunate to be part of the executive team. And so I got to experience uh, meetings that I wouldn't have been exposed to. And so, I mean, learn, learning how to deal as an executive um, helped out a lot, you know, just in terms of planning and having the confidence, being able to put together a business plan, execute a business plan. Um, but, but getting into a completely new industry, very, very humbling. Um, you think you know a lot, you know, and, and that's what I wanted to do, right? I did want, I wanted to be exposed to the point that I was pressed on issues and I was having to make decisions that, you know, I, I appreciated that watching Paul kind of go through that path with Gator. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought I could walk the same road. And so coming in, in a completely different industry, um, very humbled. I, I'll tell you, I have a new appreciation for, um, customer facing retail, especially, <laughs> Food and beverage. I mean, this is this is a hustle. This is a grind. This is this is not an easy industry. I'll yeah, put it that way. For sure. Um, so you get, I mean, you get through COVID and you're able to kind of open the doors to have people in here again, serve beer on on uh, having beer consumed on premises, and the and the, really the vision for Fractal kind of starts over again. I mean, the COVID just kind of messed up everything. Um, and only in the last couple of years have you kind of really been able to expand into this canning that, that, that you do a huge part of. Robo, can you talk a little bit about what that process looked like to get started with canning and kind of some of the unknown um, question marks that you did not know when you went into this and how you've been able to kind of be successful? That's a really good question. So I can't tell you how many times me and Larry would sit in the office, scratch our heads, and teeter-totter on the idea of, is a canning line worth the squeeze? Is it worth getting it now? Do we push it off? It wasn't initially in the plan right now to get, um, looking at what COVID did, and then you see how grocery stores are still open, right? Well, you always see canned beer in a grocery store, right? 
But when these restaurants and stuff are closed or nobody's going to them, they're not serving draft beer. So the answer was simple at that point when we thought about it, and it's get a canning line. Put cans on shelves as much as possible. That's how we can keep the engine moving here and keep production moving and keep the brewery floating and, and moving forward. So um, we got the canning line about a year ago here in April. Um, took about three weeks to get a tech down here to commission it with us, walk me through it, get it set up, and uh, a lot of challenges came with that. <laughs> a lot of challenges. It took us a couple months, a couple of runs, because we were real slow pumping out cans in the beginning, because we were only canning time taker at the time, and we weren't doing a whole lot of it. So it took us a couple of months doing that just to work all the ghosts out of the machine, uh, get it dialed in where it needed to be, and then we start running into the issue of aluminum in cans, and can shortages, and then it's like, oh my gosh, we just invested in this, we <laughs> just got it out here, we just got it running, and now we have another uh, bump ahead of us that we gotta deal with. And uh, fortunately, we were able to work with a really good canning company that was still able to get us some cans. Uh, we actually worked with a new marketing team out of California that actually done some stuff for breweries before and had a lot of experience. So we came out with new branding for these cans, really, um, Dived into canning, knew that would increase the production. So, uh, pull up some cans up here. So, we got guava mango in cans, <laughs> got IPA infinicose in cans, Time Taker, which was the OG, and this isn't even the original label. The original label was, it was fun to kick off with, but <laughs> it wasn't, we knew it wasn't what we wanted to go long term with. And then we got Amber. So, the four core beers is what we focus on putting in cans. And like I think that what's interesting is the, the comment that you made that you know you're sitting along you, you and Larry in the office thinking about you know how can we continue to have this vision you had for Fractal before COVID and continue continue to do that and the, the canning line is like is it's it the canning but, line was the key but revenue wasn't really it was hard to warrant buying the equipment when you're not able to have as many people how tough was it for you on your end to kind of make that decision to like okay. We're going to upfront this expense to get this, knowing that long term it's going to be successful, but right now it's a little scary to, make, to sign this check or to press order. It's just money. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's taking a lot of gambles on me. It, it's true. I mean, so, I mean it's, it, it, you got to place your bets. And as you know, we, we had a business plan, and as COVID did, uh, the, the consumer shifted you know, from yeah. draft into package format. And we either pivot and go after it, or we sit there and we suffer even more and more with draft format. And so yeah. it, it, was, it, was, it was a painful decision, but it was the right decision, and it's, it's paying off now. So. And uh, so, like, seeing now, and uh, Fractal's kind of played a role. It, it, it plays a role as, as COVID has kind of exited. You're able to do a lot more events, too. And events and being a part of the community is a huge part of kind of the business plan you had in mind when you first started. Uh, one of y'all's big events that you do is Sauertage. And I know that, Damon, you just kind of joined the team recently. How has your, your role kind of expanded as you've been, only been here for a short a few months? And kind of what does the future look like as far as these events and more canning and all that moving forward? Yeah, and my role is general manager, so I've, I've got a lot of different hats I wear. And one is this, this tap room here and expanding the, the, you know, the offerings of entertainment in here, the customer experience. Uh, and uh, and working with Robo and Larry on putting putting together good events like Sour Taj, which is coming up May 21. Um, that's going to be a great all day music and uh, sour beer fest. So be be looking out for that. But uh, so so that's kind of the the main thing in here is uh, you know finding ways and you know it, we got this great space, we got this great stage and, and sound system in here. So we we definitely want to maximize what we can do with it in the future. Whether we've had Zane Lamprey do comedy come through here we've had we've had great touring acts that have come through here in the past within the past several months and we want to start doing getting into more of that and uh, having fun with that here in the tap room um, um, but uh, and then as in in the market of course we, we've done a great job in Huntsville I think I think our products are in a lot of places we want to be there's some, there's still a lot of room for growth particularly with um, you know some of the chain type stores which is a little you know when you're dealing with corporate type accounts is a little more work to get into those, but we're, we're making headway on that. And uh, getting, you know, we're, we're statewide with our, uh, we got a great partnership with our distributor, Alabev, 
who uh, carries our products across the state, and little by little, we're, we're making inroads. I, I spent three days in Birmingham last week just riding the market and working with different accounts, setting up events with them. So uh, that's kind of our goal is just little by little is maximize what we can do in the state. Yeah, so well, hold on. I want to jump yeah. in real quick and just, and just say that was another element that really helped us uh, get through COVID was, was having a very strategic partner with Alabev and, and our rep who's here tonight, Jason, we're, I mean, working with us and just really saying, you know, here's how it's pivoting. Here's what you need to do. Maybe offer that brand. I mean, they were, they were invested in us and it was a, it was a really big partnership and, and we really appreciate that. I mean, that, that was one of the elements that helped kind of guide us through, if you will, to get through the other side of COVID. So big time shout out to Alabev. Yeah. Thank you, Alabev. Yeah. They're kind of, they've been our eyes and ears on the market, you know, sometimes we get caught up in what's going on in the day-to-day -day of this place and just getting product out, and they're the ones who actually are out every day meeting people and seeing, uh, meeting accounts and uh, kind of, I mean, they, they represent a lot of folks, but they do they do it really well. And so, but we're make, I'm making a lot of effort now to get out in the market a lot more as well and build those relationships with the accounts and, yeah, and make sure that you can find fractal beer <laughs> everywhere, all over town. Yeah, so I, I think that's like, it's is, is, is a super like, I think the biz, the model is what you, what you have here, and like the amount of different of different kinds of events you've been able to accomplish here. I mean, for, like you said, from comedy to sour touch, few, full music festival, um, to smaller bands, to bigger bands, to all sorts of different things in between. But to keep them coming back too, you have to have a really, really great tasting beer. And so, Robo, what does that look like moving forward, as far as the canning is concerned, as as well as just like collaborations you have on on draft options that you can only get here at Fractal. How does that look like moving forward in, in, in the future? So it's funny you mentioned that. So um, we keep talking a lot about Sour Dodge. So we actually did a collab today um, with uh, Ashley Monroe out of Birmingham. Um, her handles, Breed Black Girl, she's awesome, love her. She came up here all the way from Birmingham today to brew a collab with us for Sour Dodge, an imperial cherry limeade sour, right? Um, doing stuff like that a few months ago, I, uh, I actually flew up to Richmond, Virginia, did a collab up there. So. That's what we're trying to focus on is more involvement, not just with community and customers, but also with the community of brewers and breweries. Uh, there's a lot of bond, a lot of friendship, and a lot of things that can be learned with doing collabs and stuff like that. Uh, I can't tell you how many things I've learned just going to another brewery and, and seeing a technique or something that they do, you know, versus how I do it. Everybody does something different. And uh, having that opportunity to go out and work with uh, fellow brewers of all levels and all experiences and learn things from them and be able to share some of my knowledge with them. It's incredibly rewarding. Um, it's the same with like teaching Calhoun. So we teach Calhoun yeah. courses here at Fractal as well. Uh, we teach professional brewing and home brewing courses. I'm the instructor for it. And um, it, it's very satisfying, very rewarding to be able to, to bring these people in. They sign up for it through Calhoun and they get to learn here at Fractal. Um, and hopefully, potentially, be able to be hired to walk into a brewery one day and say, hey, yeah, I, I learned at Fractal. Yeah. You know, I went to Calhoun, but I learned through Fractal. And that's, that means a lot to me. Yeah. Being and, and, the and, the space, and the space warrants it. I mean, the space allows you to have those collaborations and, and those things and where you can engage with the community. Like you said, I mean, like you're, oh, yeah. you brew a beer with Calhoun's class, and that beer is now on draft for people to consume that aren't from Calhoun or that, aren't, that didn't actually participate in the class but you've had a brown ale that was amazing. I mean, you, you have all sorts of different ways that you're engaging with the community through events and through teaching and through all sorts of different things that I think, you know, is, is I, I, I imagine was part of the plan that Larry had in, in mind for what this place is going to be able to offer the community for years. Oh, yeah. I mean, another thing we do, too, and uh, a big community tie-in is we actually host Marine Corps birthday here. Uh, Marine Corps veteran myself. Damon's actually a veteran. So the management here is veterans. All of production's veterans. My assistant brewer, Josh, love the guy. He's a Navy veteran. Um, I think Larry hired a good, smart team of, <laughs> of individuals by doing that. Um, we all worked well together. But um, every year we do the Marine Corps birthday here. We do a special beer called Valor. We're actually going to be putting it in cans this year. So if you hear this, you get a sneak peek, something cool <laughs> coming out. Um, and the cool part about doing Valor and the Marine Corps birthday is – uh, YCH puts out a hot blend every year called the Veterans Hot Blend. And for the past two years, Fractal's been selected out of 20 breweries across the United States. Actually, there's like 500, but 20 breweries were selected. Uh, they had to be veteran brewed, operated, and um, we select the blend for the Veterans Hot Blend. And that's what we use in Valor each year. 
Uh, this year was really cool because we had Damon on board with us now, so we could add another veteran to the panel with it, so it wasn't just Larry and I in there and trying to, trying to use our senses to figure out how we're going to do this and put it together. So um, be on the lookout, too, for Marine Corps birthday stuff if you're a veteran. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. So there were, there were three primary goals in the business plan. Um, number one was, you know, I knew what the master plan for John Hunt Park is for the city. It's a 420-acre park that used to be the old airport. Uh, the city wants to turn it into the central park of Huntsville, and it's got uh, destination niche sports all throughout it, from uh, cross-country to mountain biking to uh, the Tony Hawk skate project, the getaway skate park, concrete skate park's being built right now, um, all the way up to repurposing Joe Davis Stadium. And so I wanted to be in front of that, and I wanted to lock in and kind of like be the, the brewery for John Hunt Park. So check did that. Number two, I wanted to uh, make sure that we were brewing the highest quality beer that we possibly could. And uh, I think Robo's executed that extremely well, especially the number of awards that we've won this year. Yeah. Uh, multiple international beer uh, silver medals for what? Uh, Invariant and Let's also see. Guava Mango. Yeah, Invariant took two silver international medals. Uh, Guava Mango's taken a silver international medal. Uh, Time Taker's taken two bronze international medals. And then the uh, Marizen that's coming out in the fall that we're going to possibly put in cans as well took a silver internationally as well. Right. So, and then the third goal was to be a conversation forward location. And, and what that means to me is, is that I want, you know, we're, we're not serving food. A lot of people knock us because we don't have a kitchen and, that, and that's fine. Um, we're not here to turn tables. We're not here. That's not how we make our profit. We're here for people to come use this as their living room. Uh, the patio, we want people out here having those conversations. We want to host uh, community announcements. We want to host bands and we want to host, uh, you know, Opera Huntsville. You know, we just want to get real creative with our space and just let the community come use it. And so those were the three primary goals that I had uh, coming into this, and I think that we've accomplished all three of them. Yeah, I mean, like you said, the, the, the long-term vision for this area is incredible, but it definitely was tough when there wasn't something that was happening. There wasn't dirt turning when you first said, you know, I'm going to make this space that's been dormant for two years, make this this next great brewery. People were like, ah, this is, are you, Lehman Ferry, are you, are you sure? But you, like, how tough was it? Or was it tough to kind of deal with the criticism of maybe that place, maybe there's a reason it's dormant? Or how tough was that for you? No, that's a good question. So um, we definitely are a destination location, right? I mean, we're not, uh, we're not part of Campus 805, a lot of foot traffic. We're not part of downtown, a lot of foot traffic. Uh, we're destination, but um, at the same time, there's a lot of sports that are going on. So we do get a lot of benefit from the, the hockey community or uh, parents that are dropping kids off at dance or karate or soccer or tennis or many of the other sports. And so, you know, there, there's, there's pluses and minuses. Um, but as, as the park develops and as more food and beverage, there's actually some good plans for some other businesses that are going to be showing up on Lehman Ferry that it's pretty exciting. That um, yeah. This is going to become a pretty exciting corridor once John Hunt Park becomes fully energized uh, in 2023, and, and you know the, the plans that they're talking about for Joe Davis, pretty darn exciting. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be here. You know, we, we're out in front of it, maybe a little more, a little further out <laughs> in front of it than I wanted to be. Um, but um, hindsight, hindsight 2020. Hind, hindsight's 2020, but it, it's coming. Uh, you know, I've, it's the, the Huntsville's doing a fantastic job of, um, of very smart growth, and the, and the park is is executing well. Yeah. So you, you, Robo, you talked a little bit just about like. I mean, at the moment you kind of started Fractal, there was other, I mean, craft beer was a, a big part of Huntsville already. Um, but you're, you're, you're building off a lot of what the community already has and kind of creating this collaboration atmosphere in a way that kind of continues to allow these new breweries and these new pop-ups to happen. And how, how important is that role for you to kind of be that leader in as far as like doing these homebrew classes and, and doing these thing, things that Calhoun and all this other sort of stuff? How important is it for you to see this craft beer scene continue to grow in Huntsville? Uh, it's a passion for me, so I, I love seeing it. Um, I, I like being a leader. Um, I, I give a lot of credit to the Marine Corps for uh, making me that way. But um, it, it's, it, like I said before, it's, it's extremely rewarding. Um, like even some of my students now, they come up and they want to volunteer. They want to dive into it. You know, there's like, I just want to learn more, you know, and those are the students that I really, really appreciate and really in, enjoy teaching because they, they're leaning into it. You know, um, even some of these other breweries and stuff that will contact me and say, hey, I'm, I'm stuck on this, you know, and I do the same thing. Um, Paul White, a good buddy of mine, he's a he's a really good brewer and a, a lab guy and a chemist. And uh, from time to time, I have to call on him just to lean on him for stuff. And it's it's nice to be able to do that. And I know it's rewarding for him for me to have to contact him sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's 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 good. I enjoy doing it. And I'm I'm glad that we have 
the ability to do it, and that Calhoun and Fractal gave me the opportunity to step out in front and do that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so it's... It's, cr it's crazy just how, you know, being in the right place at the right time is really successful, but also having a lot of hard work and accompanying that makes, it, makes these projects, makes these ambitions, these goals much more fathomable and, like, actually happen. Um, I, I, I recently re read, I was reading a book, and it was talking just about a, a whole different kind of tangent, but it was talking about Bill Gates and just his, you know, out of the, out of the amount of high schoolers at the time that... And then how many high schools were in that state? How many high schools went to that school that had the lab, like, computer? And, like, all these different steps that, like, gave him a really unlikely chance that he would even be successful, but that he was in the right place at the right time. How much of the success thus far at Fractal would you contribute to being in the right place at the right time? And how much would you contribute to your hard work? Um, COVID, I'm going to say hard work. Yeah. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, is, is, it, is it luck when something happens? Well, you know, I, I firmly believe that you've got to prepare yourself for good luck to happen to you. And that usually means you've got you to be very, you have to be passionately pursuing something. And if you're passionately pursuing something and preparing yourself and studying, you open yourself up for those uh, fortunate things when they do come your way. You know, some people get lucky out of the blue. Some people have passion projects that never turn into anything. But at least if you're, if you're passionate and you're dedicated, you're preparing yourself for those fortunate things when they do come your way. So, so is, is that the advice you'd give someone that's listening that if they like have a passion project or have an idea of starting their own small business? I mean, the small business industry is a very tough industry. I mean, food and beverage is a tough industry, but in general, being a small business owner is a very, very tough industry. Is that, the, is that your number one piece of advice or is there a piece of advice that you would give somebody that's listening that wants to start something but doesn't really know how they should do it or kind of the advice that you'd give them from having experience? I, you definitely find something that you're going to be passionate about because when times do get tough, you know, it, it's, it's really easy to let go of the rope, you know, or to really say, man, maybe this just wasn't meant to be. But if you passionately have, if you've got that passion and you're pulling on it, that, you know, it's going to carry you a long way. The second thing I'd say is talk to as many other people that have been in that position as you possibly can. Uh, learn as much as you can from other leaders that have been there, that have had a very similar walk. They, they want to tell you their story. They want to, I mean, that's what's beautiful about Huntsville is that it's a very fostering community across industry, across everything else. There's, some, there's unbelievable leadership here in this town. Um, and you just got to reach out. And the other thing, your professional community, your, your accountants, your attorneys, um, they're very knowledgeable and they want to help you as well. So if, if you really think about opening up a small business, do a lot of conversation and try to talk to as many different people uh, as, you, as you can. Um, share your business plan. Let them beat it up. Let them <laughs> give you pointers. Um, that's what I'd say. So how can people connect with Fractal, support you in what you're doing, and kind of this vision that you have moving forward for Fractal being here? Uh, how can people connect with you? Uh, step one, come to the tap room. Come enjoy a beer. Uh, find us in the stores. Uh, we do have Instagram. We do have Facebook. Uh, we have a website that we need to update. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ways to reach out to us, but, I mean, the best way is come on up here to Fractal. Don't be a stranger. Um, if you see me, Robo, out here on the brew floor, don't be afraid to, to yell my name. Have me come over for a conversation. I'll sit down with you with a beer, answer any questions you got, stuff like that. Um, Damon's usually here with me as well. Larry's hit or miss sometimes <laughs> here, but uh, he's easy to reach out to as well if you ever need anything. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me. Uh, it's been great learning more about Fractal, the, the story of Fractal, and the journey it took to get where you are today. Um, since we are live, we are going to open up the floor for any questions, any Q&A that anybody that's here wants to ask. Uh, we have a mic over to my right, y'all's left, uh, if you want to ask any questions. Um, but if there is no questions or anybody, no? Crickets? I'll buy a beer for the first person that asks a good question. Ooh, I don't think we have any questions. Oh, oh, oh here oh, they come. Yeah, that's he what we got to do is throw a lure beer. out there. He heard free beer. Yeah, I was just wondering. Um, Wait, we're going to do this city council style? You have to give your name and uh, where you live? No, I'm kidding. That's a, uh, Age? No. Not really. <laughs> Old. Um, no, I, I was going to ask, this was kind of for Larry, is when, they, when, when, when uh, COVID kicked in, uh, how the arrived system, you, you got that ability to order online. How critical was that to kind of helping you put up that first level barrier of, of defense against, you know, 
the difficulty of getting people people in seats and product and market. How critical was was arrived making that? Well, I don't know if it was arrived, but the the ability to order and place an order and come pick it up. How critical was that to uh, helping you shore up, you know, your business? Uh, great question. So, ar arrived. Uh, what he's what he's uh, referring to. That's our point of sale system. Um, arrived is a company out of Colorado. Uh, that develops point of sale systems just for breweries, and so um, it was actually very helpful. I mean, they 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 saw the pain first and foremost with all their clients, and so they pivoted really really quickly to develop this online sales based on all the products that we had in the point of sale system. Um, so what that allowed us to do, since we were able to sell beer to go, they could get those orders in, and we could fill the cans through our again at that point in time just the October can seamer that we had. Um, fill them up, have them in a bag ready to go, and then when they showed up, we were able to deliver. So it actually, it was good to be able to fill things ahead of time and, and you know, give me something to do while I was sitting here twiddling my thumbs by <laughs> myself. Um, so no, it was, it was actually remarkable to see how the whole beer industry pivoted to help each other. And, and you know, Ecos, we use that for our uh, CRM system, resource management, um, arrived with a point of sale system, and then, you know, again, Alabev, just everybody helping each other out was fantastic. Well, let's see, we, we might have another question. Yeah, this I, I thought about this while we were sitting down. Um, what what laws or things were, what, or rules were suspended during COVID to allow you guys to perform tasks that beer industry is not typically allowed to do, in terms of the delivering packaging to go were suspended that maybe they they've put back in place now that people are in things that maybe should not be. Uh, Ooh, good question. Uh, maybe should not have been put back in place. <laughs> Oh, I don't like this question. I know. It's kind of a loaded question in, in some regards. So, I mean, they, the, you know, I'd say the state of Alabama did pivot it, and they allowed uh, curbside delivery, which was a benefit to the industry. And we really appreciate them looking out for um, small businesses like this, seeing that we were in a crunch pain point and opening up the aperture of the law just a little bit to allow us to go. Um, in terms of the other questions, uh, you know, what stays, what goes, um, I don't know. They've, they've got a lot to consider with a lot of different breweries and a lot of different um, uh, retail accounts. And so, you know, the alcohol industry, alcohol law is not easy. Uh, so it, it is what it is, and we just have to deal with it. Yeah. I do want to say thank you to the ABC for still allowing us to operate and produce and working with ways to be able to do that with curbside pickup to make sure everybody was safe and that we could still perform business. So head nod to the ABC. Thank you. Well, oh, get, get another question. Did you read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers? The book that I referred to, I believe, was uh, The Psychology of Money. I... Okay, Outliers went along the same okay. line. All right. yeah. uh, okay, I got a question for all of you. Um, basically, and this dovetails into the previous question, what do we, as patrons of this place, look to as far as governance, all right? You know, what governance, what laws either support or threaten something like this. Because, you know, until I moved to Huntsville, a lot of things were overregulated, not very original, and streamlined, kind of like the Disney effect. You come to Huntsville, you have all these different homebrew, uh, craft brew places that are open. They serve good beer. What do you guys perceive as a threat, or where can we go as far as, you know, against certain laws or ordinances that are being proposed against something like this? You know, I, we're, we're kind of fortunate that we've got the Alabama Brewers Guild, um, which is, you know, it's, it's the co-op that we're all a part of. And so they, they have, um, they've spent a lot of time uh, looking at, you know, the problems uh, or the issues that the big breweries, you know, the straight to ales, the good people, the yellow hammer, you know, people that are in regional distribution, you know, all the way down to the, to the smaller, you know, brew pub breweries, you know, the, the problem sets are, are, are different. There's a continuum of problems. The problems that I've got are way different than the problems that, um, uh, you know, Trim Tab would have, you know, just as an example. And so, uh, but the Brewers Guild does a very good job of trying to look across the board and say what's in the best interest of the industry as a whole, and, and, and let's push the boundaries on some of the beer. I mean, one of, one of the changes that they pushed for in the last um, legislative session was uh, the amount of beer that we could sell over our counter to go. So previously, it was just... Um, what was that? Two cases. Yes, yeah, two cases, equivalent of two cases of beer. How many ever ounces that would be? 
Um, now it's up to 800 and something ounces, so we can sell uh, six little kegs and we can sell uh, three cases of beer. And so it's increased, which, is, which has definitely been a benefit. And so we appreciate the fact that they're like, okay, we've seen how the industry's going. We'll allow a little bit more because we know people are doing it safe. Um, you know, and I'd say that the, 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 the legislation, I mean, that's part of their job. They're not here to like close us all down because then they lose all their revenue stream. And so they really are here to maintain and make sure that we're holding standards and as long as we're holding standards, you know, they're, they're pretty easy to work with so far. And so um, I haven't run into anything that's like true total roadblock to what we're trying to do. It's more of me just learning um, what, what's the right regulations, what's the right reporting, just so that we're above board and in line with what they're looking for. Snaz Bazalorian Heights Kabat. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's come a long way. It's, it's really amazing. You know, I... I got involved with, you know, Free the Hops back in the really early days when we had 6% ABV laws and uh, <clears throat> no growlers, no, no tap rooms. Uh, opening a brewery was extremely difficult with the laws um, the way they were. And I got to say, we live, really, these are really good times. I, and I, but I do think it's important to keep that we stay vigilant and keep groups, uh, the, the Brewers Guild strong, keep Free the Hops strong. You know, they kind of act as watchdogs and and uh, and keep the community aware of what's going on. But, I mean, I got to say, yeah, I mean, it, since since all the, a lot of these changes have been made, think, things have been pretty good. I, we've, we've, we found legislature, le, legislators and, and, and uh, elected officials have been pretty supportive of us, you know, whereas in years past, maybe they thought this, we were... You know, we were gonna this. We were gonna turn this place into, uh, I don't know what. But it it's so it's there's been a lot of support from uh, a lot of our, our elected leaders lately. So it, things have been pretty good. I, I feel pretty confident that we've got a good relationship, and they see that we what we've done is good for the community. And if you look at some of the things, uh, what's going on at Campus 805, or things that are going on in Birmingham, and and just how how what what the brewing community has done for you know revitalization efforts in different cities i th i think right now i think we're, we're we're in a positive light i'll say yeah i'm just going to jump on that real quick and 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 say that um uh, the mentality shifted toward breweries over the last 10 years you know alabama may be a conservative state you know and and, and maybe they you know some some pockets have frowned on alcohol uh, but even those uh, legislatures now see how much of a benefit it is for tourism uh, downtown Huntsville Link has got a craft brewery's trail. We're on the craft brewery trail, and we get people that come visit. You know, they're going around the trail, hitting all the different breweries. And what I really, really like about that is that every different brewery in Huntsville is an expression, or, or craft breweries everywhere. I, you know, when I travel, I want to go hit the craft breweries, just because to me it's an expression of local culture. You know, if I were to go to Nashville, Nashville's breweries feel different than Huntsville's breweries, and they feel different than uh, Birmingham breweries, but they're, they're, it, it's just an expression of local culture. And even within that, I mean, you go to all the different breweries in Huntsville, they feel like Huntsville, but they're still different. We have different, different business plans, different gambles, different, you know, whatever approaches we're taking, but it still kind of expresses Huntsville, and that's what, that's what I love about all the craft breweries here in Huntsville, so... Yeah, I I'm, yep. I'm going to hop on that real yeah, quick, too. Go right ahead. So actually coming from brewing in North Carolina, you know, one of the most progressive states, I guess you can say, when it comes down to craft beer and stuff, um, self-distribution, all that was, I'm not going to say the Wild West, but it was pretty close to that up there in North Carolina. Uh, and I remember coming down here and uh, starting to work at Rocket Republic, and I remember somebody coming in there from out of state saying, hey, can I buy a keg? And I was like, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. And I remember loading this keg up on a dolly and... Then somebody come out and be like, whoa, 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 we can't do that, you know? And I'm like, whoa, okay, this is totally new to me. So now you look at Alabama, and it's like, now we can actually sell kegs out of our tap room, which is nice. And it's like, all right, cool, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So when you start comparing it to other states, especially like North Carolina and stuff like that, then you can say, okay, Alabama's, they've, they've come a long way just in three years alone just with, with craft beer and laws with craft beer. So I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. I think... Uh, a lot of people realize what craft breweries can actually do for the state. So I think we're doing good. We'll do one last question. Yeah, if you guys don't mind, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so Fractal Brewery is veteran-owned and operated. So to start with, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Sourtage is going to be a great event. If I was just hoping you could talk a little bit about where the proceeds for that event are going to go. 
Yeah, great. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So Sauertage, uh, it's an event um, that um, Aaron Hoffman, uh, DJ A Twist, turns out he was the electrician that did all the, electric, the electrical work uh, here at Fractal. Um, he's in a band called the Beastie Goys, and they're fantastic. Okay, and so we did, when we did Sauertage last year, it was like, let's get the Beastie Goys out. Uh, let's release some sour beers. Um, it was June. Uh, during COVID, we didn't know what to expect. We had 300 people show up, and it was just fantastic energy. It was great. Well, Aaron came to me um, after the event. He came, he came to me, and he's like, this is great. Let's do it again next year, but do you mind if we uh, make it a fundraiser? I, you know, I, I'd really like to do a fundraiser for mental health. And um, I, I was a very easy sell on that. I think, I think mental health is something that we're all dealing with, uh, many different levels, many different approaches. And so... Um, what, we're, what we're asking for, uh, we're asking for corporate donors. We've, we've, we've got some. We're still looking for some others. But we're um, asking for a $10 donation at the door. And 100% of those proceeds are going to uh, Wellstone. So we're partnering with Wellstone here in town. Um, and what we're doing is we've created an account with Wellstone to help pay for co-pays, especially for parts of the community that can't afford insurance but still need access to mental health. And so uh, the, the money that we're raising is going to go toward that account just so that we can make mental health services across the town accessible to everybody, regardless of if you have insurance or not. So that's, um, thanks for bringing up that question. We're, we're really, really excited about that. We, we, we all feel very passionate about supporting mental health in the, in the Huntsville community. Well, thank you so much uh, for talking with me. Um, this has been something we've tried to do for about two years now, um, and so I'm glad we were able to, able to do that. I'm get glad we were able to do it live, and so thank you again. I continue to look forward to the success uh, that Fractal will have in the community in Huntsville for years to come. Yeah, appreciate you and your podcast, Clark. Keep it up, man. Yeah. Yep. Cheers. Thanks for coming out. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>